Well, it is now time. It is the time after having spent the last weeks talking about numbers, 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 how we develop the ultimate buy and hold strategy based on these asset classes from the academic community. And then we showed you how they produced the numbers did over a long period of time. And then we also showed you how we put together the portfolios, combinations of equity asset classes, some two fund portfolios, some four, five, all the way out to 10 to give perspective. But now we want, oh, and then we <laughs> introduced you to the fine tuning tables where we took those equity portfolios and matched them to bonds so that you could see the implications of stabilizing the volatility of equity asset classes and seeing what is the impact not only on protecting against the downside, but also what does it do to the upside decline in return. Anyway, all great stuff. But now we want to take these numbers from the fine-tuning table, and we want to put them to work during what we would call the accumulation period for people who are building toward retirement. We put a heading on this particular uh, table and series of tables. We call them the fixed contributions tables. And by using these tables, it is my belief that there are probably five or six really important lessons. And before I get into those lessons, what I would like to do, Daryl, you are the guy that put all these tables together. Take a few minutes, if you will, and walk us through how you constructed them so it will give our, our viewers uh, a, a sense of how it might apply to them. Sure. So we use the fine-tuning table returns to generate these accumulation tables or fixed contribution tables to show how the portfolios would compare during the time you're actually adding, adding money to your investments. And for the sake of, of uh, sort of grounding everybody here, um, we start off with an annual contribution of $1,000 a year. And we do that so because it's easy to adjust the numbers in the table by whatever your contribution is. If it's $10,000 a year, every number in this table is 10 times as big. If it's $3,000 a year, it's three times as big. And then we adjust those contributions um, by a nominal inflation rate. We don't know what the inflation rate's going to be in the future, but we use 3%. So the second year, your contribution is $1,030. And by fixed, what we mean when we say fixed, we mean that it is fixed in terms of real dollars, your contribution. So that is what results in this contribution column here. We then apply that contribution sequentially to every return from the fine tuning table. In this case, we're showing the S&P 500. Uh, so that this thousand contribution made monthly so it's 12 times $83 a month. At the end of that year, that first year, you had $1,020 if you were all in equity. If you were all in bonds, you had $1,082 a year. It was a good year for bonds in seven. But this happens all every, every year as you go through these 53 years that we have in day, the day before now. Between the 100% equity and the 100% bonds, remembering the way the fine tuning tables were constructed, the rates of return vary depending upon your equity and fixed income allocation. And you can see how that works across here. Then at the end of those 53 years down at the bottom here, this is where your portfolio value would have been. In this particular case, after 53 years, you'd have had about a little over 3 point, uh, almost 3.05 million for contributions of $126,000 in today's dollars. The, uh, let's see, the, uh, 
the other thing is that when you look at, at the bottom across here, I'm sort of getting into Paul's territory now, but when you look at the bottom numbers across here, you can see how the percentage of equity versus bonds affects the results. For comparison purposes, we've included the S&P 500 index here so that you can, when you're looking at the other portfolios, you can compare them with sort of a general uh, total quasi total market fund, the S&P 500 index. You'll notice that the returns and in the index are different than the returns in the equity. And the reason for that is because for the for the 100% equity portfolio, actually for the, yeah, for the equity portfolio, we've applied uh, a representative fixed or representative expense ratio to those returns so that they represent more, more likely to represent a return that you could have been able to capture with these sequence of returns. So I think that should help explain how this table was constructed and, and what these results are. And let me let me just uh, a couple things there. When you said, uh, uh, Daryl, that uh, the one hundred and twenty six thousand total contributions uh, represented real dollars, I I didn't know if that if that was to suggest uh, some sort of a inflation adjusted value, or was that word real what you meant to say? Uh, in, in, or is this the really unadjusted uh, for inflation number? The annual contributions are adjusted upward for inflation every year. So, so that, I got it. Okay. But that is a nominal number. The total contributions is simply the sum of all of the contributions that were made in that column. Correct, Daryl? Yes. Uh, and 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 also, um, since you shared the the expense that that the S and P five hundred there's an expense ratio, um, you would not have been able to get the S and P five hundred with a ten basis uh, expense ratio in 1976 when it came out because it was more expensive. And uh, as I recall, the idea was to apply expense ratios that are similar to what people would pay today. Is that fair? That's correct. These are these are not really meant to show what you what you could have gotten or would have gotten in the past necessarily. These these tables and the fine tuning tables, for that matter, are meant to show what a representative sequence of returns might look like. That is fairly grounded in what actually did happen in the past. The difference between the return that we show and the return that they might have actually gotten um, could, for the cases when we don't actually have real fund returns. And, um, and, and, and is an it expense not, ratio. Yes, and is it not also fair to say that an investor who was using actively managed funds to create what we're trying to create here would have had a very different return because the actively managed funds that are around today might have a 0.8% a expense ratio. So this is really thinking in terms of people being smart or, or doing the right thing, at least through our eyes, in accessing uh, low, uh, low expense funds, but some like small cap value are higher. And uh, and how did you how did you deal with asset classes that have higher expense ratios? Well, in 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 most cases for the fine tuning tables, which drive these tables, we did have actual fund returns. Mm. So right. whatever the expense ratio was at the time is represented in those returns. When we didn't have a uh, a, a fund, an actual fund that we could draw history from. We did use a, a representative index, and then we re applied a representative expense ratio against that index. Got it. Uh, so in some cases, like in some of the value funds, the expense ratio will be much higher than the, the three basis points that, that you might be able to get the S&P 500 index for. So, so it's just it's reflected in the returns. Yes, and we're just trying to be fair 
we aren't for one second suggesting that this is the return people are, are, are going to get, but we've tried to apply appropriate uh, impact in terms of those expense variable variabilities or variables, and of course, no tax impact. Uh, um, but but at least we're picking up the discipline of somebody putting the money in there and letting it work with the kinds of strategies that we've we've talked about. So uh, I think that's Daryl. I really appreciate it. And let me just share what I think are some of the really big takeaways. Uh, for one thing, uh, when I look at that bottom line number uh, under the 100% equity, and I see that having invested $126,000 grows to $3 million plus, that gets my attention for young investors who don't have a lot of money to get started. And if, in fact, somebody was putting away $6,000 a year uh, to start instead of one, we're talking about a, a multiple, using your suggestion, Daryl, of six times that number. Now, to be fair, we're looking out uh, 53 years here. And so it's not going to be common that people put away money for 53 years for retirement, but it it could happen, but what you can do in using this table is you could go out 30 years, so that would be, or 40 years, and you would notice that at the end of 30 years, starting in 70, the S&P 500 is up to almost 700,000, but there's an OO here because at the end of the next 10 years, if you kept working and you kept putting money away, you ended that with about 662,000. You ended up with about $40,000 less plus the impact of inflation uh, and taxes or however that might have impacted you. But that is uh, an oh, oh, that's something we'd rather not have happen to us. And one of the things we're hoping these tables will do is show you there is at least looking backwards a way that you could have uh, managed that uh, and even maybe done better. Now, I also want to highlight that in your spare time, if you want to sit down with this table, and you go in and track year after year, you would notice that in almost every year that the amount of money that you ended that year with is higher than the year before. Now, there are some notable exceptions. The first one happened in 1974. I would not call it notable, but what did happen is you ended the year with $4,124, and you had ended the previous year with $4,300 approximately. So there is an example where you didn't make any money, even though you were continuing to put money in. And that money you're putting in is, is helping to keep this process uh, 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 above the previous year. And you, if you go down, by the time you get down to 19, I mean, yeah, 1989, with the exception of that one bad year, every other year has been up. And part of that is because there were some good years in the market, but part of it is because you were adding money to your portfolio. And uh, But then as we go further down, we can see that sometimes, uh, in fact, if we even looked at 2000. 22, and you see that you ended the year with about uh, 3,048,000. The previous year, you had 3,717,000. So the bigger these accounts get, the more money you have, uh, the, the, the bigger these losses could be, depending on how much in equity and how much in fixed income. Now, I also want to go over under that 100% bond uh, a series of, of, of uh, investments and returns. And notice that you would have turned your 
126,000 into about uh, $532,000. And Daryl made a comment about adding just a little bit of the S&P 500, then 10% would have taken it up to 654,000, 20% up to 799,000, and 30% up to 971,000. So if we can somehow help people create a trust to keep putting money into something that they would rather not be putting money into equities, They don't like the idea of equities because they think of equities as something very risky and it's a speculation and it's like gambling. But if you could have the the confidence to at least put 30% in, I just think it will make a a huge difference uh, for for your retirement. And And I want to just take this moment, again, looking at that 971,700 under the 30% equity, 70% fixed income combination. Daryl, if you could take me to uh, a table, I believe it is, uh, a, is it C11 or 14? That's uh, 14, C14, if you've got it right there. The two fund portfolio. Yeah, that's a C10. We'll come back to that. C14. Now, here we have a combination of the S&P 500 and the small cap value. And we're going to look for a second at what ends up at the bottom of that 3070 column is $1,178,000. And so... I'm thinking for anybody who's going to be conservative in in terms of how much equity they put into the portfolio, they might want to look at the fine-tuning your asset allocation result over that 53-year period to see if they might be more comfortable with something more than just the S&P 500. And, Daryl, if you'll give me C10, I think it was, that you had up there a second ago. Sure, just one comment about this. The 30% equity is 15% S&P 500 and 15% US small cap value. So the the, if you wanna call US small cap value extremely risky, um, it's only 15% of your portfolio at that point. Good point, yes. We'll go back here and look at, which one did you wanna look at? I want to look at the all value US, C11. Yeah. I want to look down at the bottom there. And and basically, the point that you just made would be correct here. This is a portfolio that is 70% in fixed income and 15% each large cap value and small cap value. Now, notice now you're up to... $1,264,000 $1,264,000 with that small equity exposure. So there are some really important decisions here. How much you put in equity, how much you put in fixed income, how much that you, wh- wh- what equity portfolio are you going to use? The ultimate buy and hold, all 10, the four fund, the worldwide four fund. There are, other than the S&P 500, uh, there are eight other choices that people have. And the reason that we build these portfolios is so that you can really dig what we would consider deep in understanding the implications, not only of returns, but of the of the risk taken. So uh, those would be some of my thoughts. And and Chris, I know I, I know you often have some 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 wisdom to share about these kinds of decisions. What would you add? I, as you were walking through the drawdown experience in the hundred percent equity column, one of the lessons that we've tried to communicate before came to mind, and that's that young investors kind of have training wheels on. And I think that from a behavioral standpoint is really, really wonderful. 
a young investor, because they're making these regular contributions, is somewhat sheltered from or or uh, insulated from the volatility and the ups and downs of the market. And the longer they're invested, the more they're exposed to it. But because those early years are more likely to be positive, hopefully it builds some kind of resilience in their investing behavior so that later on, when they are experiencing the full volatility of the market, because when you're when your contributions become small compared to the balance that you have, they don't help you very much. They don't mask much of the ups and downs of the market. And you really need to exhibit good behavior to get the return for the portfolio you've chosen then. So I th I think that's one of the great stories. And it doesn't matter what column you're in, it still applies. Uh, you know, whether you're a 50-50 fixed income and equity investor or 100% equity investor, your ride is smoother in those earlier years where you have those relatively large contributions. And hopefully investors take advantage of that and realize those are good years to take risk. Those are good years to be 100% equity. Those are good years to, if you're in a target date fund, to compensate by maybe holding a little small cap value. And then as you move along and you see the volatility increase and you approach retirement, be aware that the, the risk profile changes and maybe you need to cool your jets a little bit to get the the volatility that you're going to live with back in line with what you can actually tolerate. So I, I just think there's some really interesting lessons in how the cash flow impacts the volatility and the bumpiness of the ride that you're experiencing. I also noted as you were talking, uh, about, uh, that's really a, a, an important uh, uh, suggestion, Chris. I also noted, I, I set myself up early on to show you that bad situation from 1999 to 2009 for the S&P 500, where you ended up at the end of 10 years with less money than you had at the beginning. Even but, after all your contributions. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And here, because there is diversification between asset classes, and I realize there's a certain amount of what we would call data mining uh, that, that that's going on here, but I can tell you, this is exactly why I believe in the idea of putting together more than just one equity asset class. I notice with the U.S. all value, it goes from 896000 to one almost $1.8 million instead of going down. And, and if you and you take us, if you can, Daryl, uh, to the 50-50 S&P 500 small cap value, let's look what it did from that 1989 uh, uh, or 1999 through 2009. It goes from 871,000 to 1.35 million dollars. Again, I call that a home run during a period of time. Who a lot of people who just who just counted for all their equity on the S&P 500. And I'm sure one of you would want to talk about the four fund strategy, uh, if, 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 if you uh, wouldn't mind. And, and let's look at the same thing there. Um, Chris or Daryl, do you want to take a whack at that? Because that's also all U.S. You can get it all U.S., and and uh, so it's in a way it feels to me like owning the S and P five hundred, um, uh, but more, but more, but better. And uh, if you can pull that table up, Daryl, maybe we could uh, just see what that one looks like. Sure. One one other comment I I would make on this table, and actually it applies to the other one too. When we were looking at the U S all value, is that. If you remember down here, the S and P 500 over the past year lost what was it, seven hundred thousand dollars, six hundred, seven hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. This one loses about the same actually, but if you go back and you look at the all value one here, it's only a little over three hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. So this this to me points out that diverse that diversification uh, should work. Um, 
So it will be interesting to see what the U.S. four fund looks like. So here's the U.S. four fund. So in 99, we had six, $783,000. And in 2009, we had almost 1.3 million. So it goes from about 800,000 to 1.3 million. So it grew by $500,000 over the decade where you lost 30,000, excuse me, in the S&P 500. But the, uh, the U.S. 4 fund and the U.S. 2 fund, since they're both half in blend and half in value and uh, half in large and half in small, you would expect them to do close to the same. And they are pretty close to the same. If you, right. if you round to the 100,000, it's basically 800,000 to 1.3 million in both cases. They're, you you really wouldn't expect them to be very different, but they are a little different in their complexity. Um, well, also, there's another lesson right here on this four fund strategy. And I'm looking at the 60-40 column. And I'm remembering that the S&P 500 itself, 100%, uh, well, in fact, we can see it had about $3 million at the end of the uh, 53 years. And the 6040 has about $2.4 million. In fact, at 7030, it has almost $3 million. So if a person is more conservative, uh, and if you were to go back and look at the work that we did in those sound investing portfolios, where we actually showed that the four fund strategy could be viewed as less risky than the S&P 500, I'm not talking about one day at a time, but uh, over longer periods of time, it says that you could get the same return, but not have to take so much risk. So that is another possible way to, to, uh, to look at these tables. So I'm hoping that you will look at all of the, well, there are actually nine tables, including the S&P 500. Wait a minute. I just remembered uh, before Daryl catches me on that one. There's also a set of tables for people in the international markets that are 70-30. And uh, I, I, I will tell you that uh, if you had value in the portfolio, the 70, 30, U.S., 70 percent, international, uh, 30, you ended up with higher numbers. And yeah, we, this is this is an example of that this this one, when you have worldwide or international component, this one, these set of tables have 50, 50 there. There is a set that has 70, 30. Yeah, so that's what Paul is saying. Yeah. Doesn't always apply. This one's 100% U.S., so there's no equity, but there are no international. So I I really want to encourage, pardon me, encourage you, if you have questions about this table, and I'm assuming if you'll take the time to send me that question, Paul at paulmerriman.com, that there's somebody else that has that question, and uh, it would be good for us to. To, to be able to uh, maybe include some of that, the, the Q&A uh, uh, format at, at the uh, underneath the YouTube uh, that this has been produced on. So comment, tell us, by the way, tell us if it's helpful in the comment section. Tell us what you would like to know that you didn't learn from this presentation. And, um, and and anything else that, that may be on your mind uh, about this accumulation period. Uh, and do either one of you have a kind of a, a, a final comment of any sort that, uh, well, I know what I'd like to know. I know. I, I, Chris, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Um, we're always talking about these, these tables like this where a person takes on a column and they stay in that column for, I don't know how long they're going to stay in that column, but there's, there's no discipline about changing columns. You, on the other hand, have developed the two funds for life strategy, where it really is about changing columns uh, for the rest of your life, not every year, but certainly some years. How do you relate when you see these tables and you think of the four, the two fund for strategy 
uh, discipline. What do you got? The very first thing that crosses my mind is that I'm frustrated we haven't figured out a way to uh, test all of the sound investing portfolios, including the two fund for life portfolios, and and show them in the same way. Uh, and it's, it's difficult. It's hard because when you have a changing asset allocation with cash flows coming and going, a single history might be lucky or unlucky. And uh, it might be particularly lucky or unlucky getting into and out of the asset classes that did well or poorly at particular times. And so this kind of one history analysis is not appropriate. And um, so that's that makes it difficult for us to compare them side by side. But uh, there are a couple of other perspectives that I think are worthwhile. One is that if you take a, a 50% allocation or something between 45 and 50% allocation to a small cap value and put the rest in the target date fund, you end up with something that's very much like a 50-50 ultimate buy and hold or a 50-50 US two fund. Um, Actually, it's probably closer to the international two fund because you have a, a substantial allocation to international in the target date fund. So for somebody who wants added simplicity, but also wants to have a prudent glide path applied on top of their investment choice over time automatically, the target date fund does that for them. Uh, and of course, you can go into lots of detail in my book about different ways to do that. Uh, I, I think that the differences are more philosophical than they are actually in terms of what you end up with as results. You Either way, whether you use a two fund for life strategy or you manage your own glide path and you increase your bonds or your fixed income as you get close to retirement, Either way, you're investing in a broadly diversified portfolio that has some exposure to these additional equity asset classes of small and value, and you're getting the benefits of that, which are not just increased return per unit of risk, but also increased safe withdrawal rates in retirement. So one of the challenges I know that we have is that th this is one uh, a series of of returns and and so it's difficult to know how to 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 represent a lifetime of making changes in the portfolio uh, of course people could manually do that with the investment lifetime investment calculator uh, it would take a little work. I mean, out of curiosity, how long would you say that if somebody went to the the investment lifetime investment calculator and actually took the time to to make the changes in the asset allocation uh, over time based on their age and whatever formula they're using, uh, how long would it take to to go through and and do that analysis? Approximately. I, I think somebody in the space of an hour could probably learn a lot. Uh, you know, it might, assuming they already had familiarized themselves with the calculator, that might take a half hour to an hour. But in a couple hours, I would imagine you could learn a lot and uh, make some good tracks. So, so I'm just throwing this idea out. What? How meaningful is it if 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 we are a first time investor in their twenties? And so we, we know we're going to be 100% equities. The problem is, is that we're hoping that that first 10 years, that, it, that the market is really bad because we want them to invest as much as they possibly can in, in, in these equity asset classes at reduced prices. But that's, not so bad that they give up. <laughs> that's the, that is exactly right. Uh, but we also, there's the possibility that their return will look like what happened from 95 to 99 or from 90 to 99. You know, it was a, a, a great decade. I think the S&P 500 compounded at about 18 plus percent. But what would it, what would the implications be 
if we basically took the average return uh, of the first 10 year, we, we look at every 10 year period, we average those and that becomes the return that we would use for, for, for testing purposes for the first 10 years, rather than biasing to, to a particular 10 year period. I mean, something like that where they could make changes between these different, these different uh, combinations of equity and fixed income, but they'd be working on basically an average uh, return in those particular uh, combinations. Any, there, any, there are any, two ways to get around this problem of having one history that might not be representative, and I've used them both in my testing. Uh, and, and there's, I'm sure there are others, but these are two broadly or, or widely utilized techniques. One is to do Monte Carlo simulation where you say every year is independent of every other year and you just randomly grab from the available history of returns that you have and you grab all the returns for all of the asset classes for a particular year and you use that for the next year. Uh, the other approach is to do uh, rolling starts where you do a scenario where you start in 1970 and then you start in 1971 for the next scenario and then you start in 1972. And a lot of times you use um, circular bootstrapping where when you get to you know, 2022, you go back to 1970 because that's where your history is. And uh, I've done them both and I've, I've found that they're both, they produce fairly similar results. So in my testing that I did in the Two Fund for Life book, I used the second approach the rolling starts with the circular bootstrapping where you you over, you go from the end to the beginning again and um, neither of them are perfect but you know as Daryl was describing his approach earlier it wasn't perfect either the one thing i think we try to do more than most is be very transfer, transparent about the imperfections when you go to uh, Vanguard or Schwab or anywhere else and you use their tools, they have all these warts under the hood, too. They just don't highlight them. <laughs> there just is no there is no crystal ball that's not fuzzy and there is no historical view that is perfect. They all have these kinds of imperfections, uh, but uh, it takes if you want to analyze something and, and get past the idea that you have just one history, you have to you have to kind of start to mix up the returns in the two ways, one of the two ways I described or something else. The one other thing I'll say, though, is that, uh, you know, you always want to avoid a lucky or unlucky set of returns. And people up until recently have criticized this period of time, 1970 to 2020, as being very lucky because it was good for equities and it was good for fixed income. But what we're seeing right now is a period of time that is historically bad for fixed income. So the set of returns that we're working with in some respects has become more representative and that hopefully gives our, our listeners and, and the people who take advantage of this analysis a more realistic view. So uh, Daryl, we have a limitation here in these tables because the international returns don't go back as far as we would like, but what would be your thoughts? And I'm not asking that we do this, but the implications of being able to go back to 1928, I'm looking on the screen at the US four fund equity portfolio, those numbers that have been dug out by the, by the academics may not be perfect, but they've made an attempt at, at looking at all public companies in building uh, these historical returns. Uh, how much more meaningful in your mind would it be if this kind of a study was done uh, starting in 1928, because we have those four large cap blend, large cap value, small cap blend, small cap value, and then be able to look at, at, at rolling 40 year periods during the accumulation and rolling 30 year periods during the distribution and we have the fixed income going back uh, uh, to 1928. How much more meaningful would that mean to you? 
95 years is probably better than 53, but neither one of them is very big and very long. So um, I think when we talked about uh, in the fine tuning tables uh, earlier, the uh, when I look at the worst performance data in the fine tuning tables, I look at that as kind of a lower bound on how bad things could be. And uh, I, I tend to, it it's, it's depends on an individual, but but I tend to be a little bit more um, conservative is not the right word, but it, but it's a little more aware of how bad things can get and temper the enthusiasm for return with the realism realism of how how far things can go down. It's hard to do. Um, and that comes back to knowing your own risk tolerance, like we've talked about before. And uh, as you've mentioned recently, you know, people don't necessarily know what their risk tolerance is until they're faced with a test of it. And so um, that's that's the challenge. I know that having that that double the length of returns. Uh, period is actually going to uh, help anything, except it will probably show you what uh, a worst case return than what we have. And in fact, I think Chris has pointed this out many times, is that the longer your time horizon goes, the worst your worst case gets. Um, you so. know, there's, there's another side to that story. If you want to look at one of the best 40-year periods in stock market history, it starts in 1933. Mm-hmm. And then it goes forward and ends up being in the middle of a war. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it. It this is the interesting thing about the market is that if you didn't look at the news, didn't know why it was up and down, uh, you, you would uh, probably not have expected the outcome. On the other hand, when you're looking at the the, the headlines, it is really easy to say. I don't think now is a good time to be in the market because things just don't look good for whatever reason. So, well, and, some, and some people would argue that the 1928 data isn't relevant anymore because the market was so different, the regulatory environment was so different, uh, the you know the economy was so different. Uh, so, Daryl's absolutely right. It's not a very long history, but when you try and stretch the history farther back, then you do start to question, is it the same history? Are we getting a history of something different or is it a history of something similar? Yeah, it's hard to know. Well, and I, think, I think that one of the things you have to, when you're looking at, at histories and longer histories and you start, start to think about what the economies were at the time, you, I think you can get bogged down in that. If you, if you go back and you look at the returns during at a particularly bad period of time, you say, well, that was during the Great Depression, and, and we won't have a Great Depression like that again because of all these things that are in place. If, on the other hand, you look at it as just a sequence of returns that was really bad, there's no reason you can't have a sequence of returns that's really bad. Now, it may Agreed. not be the same reason, but it certainly, it certainly could happen, I believe. Um, for any number of reasons that we may or may not even know about now, so or think about, um, at least not your average person in the street. Well, and and we should realize that in the 1929 uh, uh, 38 period, you had a very few people in the stock market. The volatility was much much greater than it is today. And part of that is is because you didn't you didn't have the great markets, the liquidity that we have today. But when you step back and you look at the ten year return, and I've talked about this before, but the ten year return from 1929 to 1938 was actually a better rate of return than from 2000 through 2009. It was more volatile in the 29 to 38 period. By the way, there was plenty of volatility from 2000 to 2009. There were two declines of over 50 percent, and and so uh, and and by and also, I don't think there was ever a day 
in the 30s that the market went down 22% in one day as it did in Octo on October 19th, 1987. So I'm kind of personally in the camp that it's it's the news is going to be different. But I think the volatility will be similar. I think the returns will be similar. But the bottom line answer is nobody knows. And I do believe that these tables that, that Daryl, you're working on, and Chris, the ones you've worked on, uh, I can take no credit for these tables. You guys have done a great job in giving perspective to the process. And I think a, a way that people can pretend uh, that they made a commitment to investing a certain amount, increasing the amount uh, that they invest a certain amount every year, and then look and see what it looks like. Run it through the investment lifetime investment calculator and see if it's good enough with risk that's reasonable to you that you can make that commitment and do it. That is what we are hoping our work is about. And unless you guys have something else you want to bring up, I'm out of here. Anything, Daryl? Nope. Ah, I'm good. Chris? I'm good. All right. Guys, thank you so very, very much. And as we always ask you, we ask you for some favors. Let me reiterate. When you go to the YouTube and you watch this thing, it does help when you like it. It does help when you subscribe. It does help when you leave comments. It helps when you leave questions and you give us a chance to answer them so that people can see, one, that we're willing to do that, and two, that our answers make sense. We hope that is the case. And Chris has talked about all this work he put into this Two Funds for Life book. Remember, that book is free as a PDF. You can get that at uh, paulmerriman.com. So is We're Talking Millions. You want to go buy it, that's fine. The problem is if you buy it, you won't send it to 100 people. If you take the free PDF, I'm hoping you're going to send it to 5, 10, 1,000 people somehow. Someday somebody is going to figure out a way. They're going to have a list that 1,000 people or more could use those books at no charge, and it would be good for their financial future. Thanks for all of your time. We know that is valuable. We appreciate you giving it to letting us try to help you have a better financial future. Thank you very much.